Our theme this year is the future, and I think we are uh, about to have our minds uh, warped, mind blown, retwisted, remixed, and reconfigured through tonight's talk. Very excited um, to introduce our guest, George Lewis, who is the Edwin H. Case Professor of American Music at Columbia University. Since 1971, he has been a member of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, Chicago-based nonprofit organization. It's been a creative home for many luminaries, uh, including Anthony Braxton, Lester Bowie, Roscoe Mitchell, and many, many more. And that was also the subject of his first book, A Power Stronger Than Itself, the AACM and American Experiment Experimental Music. That book received the American Book Award, as well as the American Musicological Society's Music in American Culture Award. A prolific composer and performer, Lewis's work has been commissioned by, among many others, the Fromm Music Foundation, National Sawdust, the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, the International Contemporary Ensemble, the 2010 Vancouver Cultural Olympiad, and my favorite, the Point Loma West Wastewater Treatment Plant in San Diego, California. As a scholar, he is similarly prolific, publishing widely on improvisation, computer music, and African American music, among many, many other things. Professor Lewis has received many prestigious awards and honors over the course of his career, and to list them all would take most of his time, so I'll be brief. He served as the Fromm Visiting Professor of Music at Harvard University, the Ernest Block Visiting Professor of Music at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, as a resident scholar at the Center for Disciplinary Innovation at the University of Chicago. Uh, he's also had residences at Brown University and other places. In 2012, he received the Seamus Award from the Society for Electroacoustic Music in the United States. And in 2016, he was made an honorary member of the American Musicological Society. He's received honorary degrees from the University of Edinburgh, the New College of Florida, and Harvard University. As well, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, and a recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, so-called Genius Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a United States Artists Walker Fellowship, an Albert Award of the Arts, and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. Tonight, Professor Lewis's talk is titled, Black Liveness Matters, Carl Chopek Meets Blind Tom. Please make welcome Professor George Lewis. Which is true, people are sort of, uh, one of those wonderful things can be angry about, so it sort of tends to 
people were very concerned that he somehow did not show his happiness, somehow not be able to describe his happiness. So I have to remember all these things when I give talks like this. Sir, so, yes? Could you write some bottom of the Oh, I can, but someone else can. <laughs> Let's try this. Hello, is this on? I can talk louder. Let's find, let's find out who's back there. Um, could you guys turn me up? They're all bottom. Oh, there we are. Let's try this. Uh, hello? Hello? Is that helping? No, it's not helping. Okay. Oh, this is Mike. Who are you? Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Well, I'll just try to talk louder and we'll see what happens. Could you turn me up? Because I don't want to scream. Okay, I'll Oh, really? Yeah. It, I think it's this mic that I use. Oh, this mic. Can I use this one too? Okay. Well, I'll do my best um, to, to say something uh, louder. Um, so, um, Let's go back to 1920 when the Czech writer Karl Čapek, how's that? Does that sound like you hear that? Um, experienced an early success with RUR. And that's a play that's uh, exercised lasting influence internationally. The play posed interaction and conflict between human capitalists and a new source of labor, the robota. And that term robota has come down to us in various languages as robot. Um, Topic portrayed the characters Rossum, Universal Robots, but that's what that stands for, artificial biological beings designed and built special laboratories and factories to perform work that humans no longer needed or wanted to do. Eventually, these human built and soon enough human enslaved artificial people uh, exceed the limits of their programming and use the sentence they acquire like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or like the doll in Jewish folklore, to smash up the place, threaten good order, and of course, we're also the universal robots actually really destroy the human race. Um, um, the reasons behind Chopek's choice of the Czech word robota have been lost to many English language critics who have been content to perform a basic translation of the term as forced labor. Um, however, um, Chopin evidently grew, drew upon a critical moment in Eastern European history, the abolition of serfdom, institution of robota, or labor tax, it's sort of like sharecropping, functioned for over 400 years, the key element in the Bohemian version of serfdom. Similar systems were active all across Eastern and also some in some Western Europe. Peasants were required to give the lord and owner of the land a certain number of days of labor per week in return for permission to live on and work the land. This is the share power motif. Uh, inevitably, the robota system came under pressure, and in response to various land reforms instituted in 1775, Joseph II attempts to abolish uh, the practice of the system entirely, but partially thwarted, leading to a form of neo serfdom that persisted until the final abolition of the robota system in 1848. Although Chopek's play does not directly refer to the institution of chattel slavery, uh, despite some scholars who have sort of speculated along those lines um, in his various European and American forms, as one character put it in the play, I want to turn the whole of mankind to an aristocracy of the world, an aristocracy nourished by billions of mechanical slaves. Thus, we could propose a number of parallels to traditional slaves in the U.S. chattel system that stand out at various points in the play. Um, in his book On Liberty, which we all know, we all know that, uh, John Stuart Mill, the philosopher, wondered, suppose it were possible to get houses built, corn grown, battles fought, causes tried, and even churches erected and prayers said by machinery, by automatons in human form. But in RUR, society has already been radically transformed by the new technology in ways that recall the immense transformations of the economy of the American South brought by Eli Whitney's cotton gin. Chopek's characters to debate undesirable alternatives to robot-driven economic and social systems 
in turn to recall the centuries-long contention over the reform of the Rabot system. No, these are two characters, Helena. But what do you think would happen if we suddenly did stop making robots? Hmm, hmm, Dr. Bob, hmm, that would be an enormous blow for the people. But why a blow? Because then they'd have to go back to where they've been. This dialogue precursors contemporary U.S. concerns over how agricultural and service work would be performed in the absence of immigration, legal or otherwise, as satirized in Sergio Arau and, and Yari, Yari Ali Mendi's 2004 film, A Day Without a Mexican, in which Californians wake up one morning to find that all persons of Mexican ancestry have disappeared. Not long after the appearance of this Prussian film, business classes, this is a few years ago, business classes in Georgia and Alabama woke up to an actual day there as a consequence of state legislation designed to force undocumented workers to leave the state as crops rotted in the fields, pursuant to legislators' fanciful belief that the self-deported would be replaced by good old-fashioned Americans willing to work hard, Georgia tried to solve its problem by using prisoners as revoking. Chapek presents the equivalent of house robots who do cooking and field robots who work the farms and factories. The farm, this is like, of course, the field Negroes who work in fields. We hear this from not to the house Negroes who stay in the house. The following passage shows us that in such systems of domination, gender typing becomes integral. Helena says, well, maybe it's stupid of me, but why do you make female robots when, when gender has no meaning for them? It's a matter of supply and demand. You see, housemaid, shop staff, typists, people are used to them being female. <laughs> a related kind of divide conquer technique is exposed later in the play that we call strategies used to divide ostensibly free persons into the new world. It's a domain, it's another factor. There won't be just one factory anymore. Each factory will produce robots of different color, different hair, different language. The robots will be strangers to each other. They will never be able to understand what the other says. And we, we humans, will train them so that each robot will hate the robot from another factory all its life, all through the grave, all through eternity. We're making Negro robots, and Swedish robots, and Italian robots, and Chinese robots, and if anyone ever talks to them about organization and brotherhood, and, well, wait a minute, I ain't going to As Chopin's dialogue puts it, making an artificial worker is just like making a petrol engine. The simpler you make production, the better you make the product. In this way, the strict delineation of the robot's place of unswerving servitude in the system of labor is enforced. The admonition to African Americans to quote, know your place, constitutes an indelible cultural and historical mark that hardly persists to this day. However, for both robots and African Americans, knowing your place is dependent on a certain refusal of subjecthood in terms of interiority and the capacity for independent expression. The inventor of the robot was said to remove all aspects of sentience that were not useful for the purpose of the work. That's to say, you throw out the man and put in the robot. Robots are not people. They are mechanically much better than we are. They have an amazing ability to understand things, but they don't have a soul. In other words, robots are objects, pure and simple. But this provides yet another occasion for me to consider the critical theorist Fred Moten's observation, very provocatively, that the history of blackness is testament to the fact that objects can and do resist. And by object, he means the black American defined as such in the traditions of child slavery and actually after. First, Moten resolves the implicit paradox of this resistant object discursively. And second, resistance can take many forms. Increasingly over the centuries, Bohemian serfs chafed at the imposition of Rogota, strikes and rebellions were by no means uncommon. Chopek's scientists recount an analogous dynamic in the workings of the robots. Well, a couple of times, not very often, mind you, they've shown some resistance. Nothing in particular. It's just, sometimes they seem to just go silent. Or it's sound like some kind of epileptic fit. Robot cramp, they call it. Or maybe some of them might suddenly smash whatever's in their head, or stand still, or grind their teeth, and then they just have to go on the scrapping. In any system of domination, resistance or rebellion can be discursively redefined as glitch. And a, you, you may have heard of Drapanomania, which uh, was defined during slavery as resistance to, wanting to be, not wanting to be a slave. That was a, that was a, uh, a known malady. And 
So we can solve that problem right now. No, 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 that's their soul. You think that grinding teeth is really their soul? We can solve that problem. He's carrying out some experiments right now. Now, in asserting that subjectivity is defined by the subject's possession of itself and its objects, Fred Lopez's important insight is that this subjectivity can be asserted sonically through what he calls the historical reality of commodities who spoke, of laborers, slaves who were commodities before, as it were, the abstraction of labor power from their bodies, and who continue to pass on this material heritage across the divide that separates slavery and freedom. <clears throat> In the United States between 1800 and the Civil War, as music historian Richard Crawford notes, most African American music was made by slaves. While the use of the drum by slaves was outlawed in many states, among other loud instruments that plantation owners feared to be literally used to drum up rebellions and conspiracies, silencing was not the only 1860 account of performance cited by the philosopher of the Harlem Renaissance, Harlem L. Locke. And this recalls a young Mozart. He could play flawlessly any composition he heard playing, used on once hearing it, he could improvise correctly and expressively, and is said to have a repertory of several thousand pieces. And he did it. This is amazing. So these are the pieces he could play at sight from memory, at sight from sight from memory. And um, another contemporary account from 1860 gives us Fred Bogus sounding commodity. Our readers will remember a recent news item giving an account of a musical prodigy in the shape of a blind Negro boy owned by Mr. Oliver of Georgia, which, the property, plays the piano too, with surprising power. A friend who knows Mr. Oliver as well known to the public writes the following enthusiastic account of his performance. This boy is an ugly little Negro as he touches the piano. Then the sightless eyeballs seem to be searching in the stars, and the great opera ear seems to be catching, searching, catching harmony from the celestial spheres. I've never heard such power, such sweetness, such emphasis, such marvelous fingering for the touch of Talbert, Harris, De Meyer, or Gottschall. And yet, this is the other little cornfield Negro of Georgia. In his, 19, in his 1771, um, Aldo Vinatelli, the Sheridan General Director of Fine Arts, Johann Gerhard Salser, we see here, proposed that we would be able to hear the Geistero, or inspiration, in Beethoven's improvisations. If only we had been there. Salzer understood that inspiration proceeded from the music itself, and not only from a perceiver's response. And was particularly excited about an English builder's 1749 plan for a piano that would convert Fantasian I improvisations that would convert these to written notation. Of course, that's still a very difficult thing to do with the Yamaha machine. You get the record machine, you play the back, but it's very difficult for to convert to uh, notation. And, um, Daphne Brooks has luminously called blind Tom performances sonic slave narratives. At the same time, Tom's narratives, like Beethoven's, were also set down in written form. As you can see here, this is one of his, uh, this is one of his publications, as notated compositions committed to paper by editors. And I'd like to suggest that just as you can hear the traces of Beethoven's improvisations in his piano sonatas, hints of blind Tom's sonic narrative are present in his written compositions. Now, in his 1863 work for piano, this is one of his most famous at the time, The Battle of Manassas, Tom deploys the classic American trope of musical depiction. Depiction, think Charles I, Duke Ellington, thunder, lightning, and the sounds of cannons are received via cluster-like sounds that anticipate by nearly 70 years early Henry Cowell, the futurist composers, and avant-garde Stan Douglas' use of the Marseillaise as well in the 1990s installation, or Sean and Stan Douglas there. So let's we'll listen, listen to a minute of the Battle of the Nazis.
last uh, major battles of the Civil War in that the Confederate side won. And so at the time, uh, when this was written, this was thought of as a, as a kind of a celebration of a major victory by the Confederate forces. However, if you listen to this now, you can also think of it in a much more ironic sense as an, an elegy for the passing of the, the great cause. Um, Song of the Shank, a recent historical narrative brought to my town by Jeffrey Bernard Allen, probes the relation between sound and soul in the context of 19th century American conceptions of black subjectivity. Early on, Allen's white characters confront the challenges Tom's music poses to their conception of black subjectivity. One of Tom's holders wonders, what can he wish? Can he aspire? Can he set goals? Other than the bali bali of a chicken desiring to feed, a bird desiring a worm, a duck drawn to a pond. Other than the set demands of nature, essentials, the changing of the seasons, or the earth's need for rain. In RUR, musical performances also mark as quintessentially human. Domine asks, do you play the piano? Helena, yes, Domine, that's good. But a working machine must not play the piano, must not feel happy, must not do a whole lot of other things. So, let's see. For a chap that's industrious, man is a being that does things such as feeling happiness, plays the piano, likes to go for a walk, and all sorts of other things which are simply not needed for activities such as weaving or calculating. Thus, chap -like robots are famous only limited subjectivity. Well, they learn how to speak, they write, they do arithmetic, as they've got amazing memories. If you read a 20-volume encyclopedia to them, they can repeat it back to you word for word, but they never think of anything new for themselves. They can make very good university lectures. <laughs> <laughs> for Fred Moten, quote, the truth about the value of the commodity is to tie precisely to the impossibility of the speaking for a commodity to speak. It would have intrinsic value. It would be infused with, infused with a certain spirit, a certain value, not, not given from the outside. Thus, sound becomes the ground for subjectivity itself, and in the Allen novel, as in Tom's actual life experience with such other music, debates about originality versus mimesis in The Negro congeal into a complex of paradoxes, all taunted by, crumbs, by Tom's undeniably subjective soundness. Here's a quote from uh, Bernard Allen's book. Between us, we've arrived, as, we've arrived at a scientific evaluation of a Negro boy who goes under the name of Tom, a slave boy who is approximately seven years of age and fraught with all the handicaps of his race, but who can also demonstrate elevated and refined musical sensitivity at the piano. He possesses the muscular ability to reproduce by hand and voice many of the finest selections from the European catalog. This is in and of itself remarkable, since the Negro's thought organ generally is a lifeless and submissive receptacle with no power of specific reaction to anything challenging or demanding that might be introduced to it. So much so that the Negro's imitative abilities are usually little better than those of a um, The emerging resolution thus, here the emerging resolution of the paradox is that Tom, like any Negro, is doomed to mere mimesis and state of nature essence rather than the originality of the creative spirit that marks the complete human. The basic tenor of that debate in its most crystallized form is on offer in Mein Kampf. Well, from time to time, our illustrated papers published for the edification of the German Philistine, the news that in some quarter or other of the globe, and for the first time that the has been established in neurobiological basis for social behavior, and I'm interested more in the signaling behavior to display to establish the communication. And um, so what, but now, oh, reveal the black.
So just to just to confirm what it says on the screen here, and this is the late Jerry Allen, the owner of Canvas, who was most recently uh, director of jazz for the University of Pittsburgh, um, the most important jazz of the early 20th century, uh, performing the concert with one of my uh, computer programs. And you can see the other, she is playing one, one piano, and the laptop in the center of the screen is playing the other. And the uh, laptop is uh, listening what the jury is doing and making up its own music based on that. And also the other thing about it is it really does need Jerry to make the music for Jerry. I told, I told her, she said, what happens if I leave the stage? Well, what do we know that? And it was Mr. Side Chicks for us. So this kind of thing has been going on for a number of years. I personally have been doing it since 1979. Um, and so that's, that counts as about 40 years now. And the, this is part of a loosely constituted field of interactive music that draws upon artificial intelligence, practices of creative composition, creating a new kind of music making that includes machines as central actors. Remember, this is a machine line. These creative machines have been designed to stick out musical territory, assess and respond to conditions, assert identities and positions, all aspects of improvisation within and beyond the domain of music and the arts. So it becomes clear that as a new media theorist, Simon Penny argues, quote, categorically new kinds of cultural practices emerge in which the machine system is constituted as a quasi organism with response to changes of perturbation in the environment. Performances and computer, performance of computer programs likely deal with the nature of music and in particular the processes by which improvising musicians produce it. And these questions can encompass not only technological and music theoretical interests, but philosophical, political, cultural, and social concerns as well. Now, here are computers performing on a software controlled acoustic piano in the Yamaha Disc Division. The program uses analysis of both, of both conditions of performances, that is to say, at 1.9 million years since I'm not right now, to guide its generation of complex responses while also establishing its own independent musical behavior. The system, as I said, the system doesn't need real-time human input to generate music. And in this performance, the improvised musical encounter is portrayed as a sonic negotiation between musicians. So who are people, so who are not. This is not electronic music. It's acoustic music, a dialogue between two improvisers playing acoustic grand pianos, thereby eliminating assumptions about liveness based on the difference between acoustic and electronic sound. For some, the computer piano might seem more live than the other piano's performance, and also when the music is being countered without the visuals. Musical expression and dialogue with computers encourages new perspectives on agency, behavior, personality, personal identity, indeterminacy, communication, and intersubjectivity. So if we're looking at relations among people and interactive systems, which you're all used to now, including what's now called the Internet of Things, which in the 1980s was called Unicom for Ubiquitous Computing, as social behavior leads to conceptions of collaborative and conversational spaces enacted via <coughs> technology. The resulting hybrid cyborg sociality, if you think of these things as being part of the social world in which humans and computers participate, is forever altering both everyday sonic life and the notion of subjectivity of high technological cultures. So at times, sonic acts that appear to present themselves as unfriendly at first, can be parsed as resistance, deviating from imitation to establish a space of resistance. In the push pool of resistance and accommodation, you build your reputation, you establish trust. Improvisation becomes the sound of negotiation, and follow poetic, interactive musical behavior, operating both independently and in dialogue with our construction games and activities. It's not a simulation of actual music, but music making itself with real world consequences and outcomes. So, Andrew Pickering's notion of sense of an agency, um, let me just let's hear from Jerry about this first. Like, here's what she thought. People asked her about, um, and who was it that asked me about this sound? He might be in this. This is supposed to be working. It's fine. This is Jerry, an audience member asked her about. Is that to say that you didn't feel like oh, the, the uh, 
machine was going to step in and hold you up if the per, if, you know if you were coming to a, a low point on your side. Well, I I, I just think it um, you know I did feel they was responding, and I couldn't I I didn't know how it was going to respond, but I knew it was going to. So it was, it was harder to predict than with a, a human associate, of course. So that's a scary moment for a lot of people. The idea that the computer is really get into that human person can be. And so there's no simple notion that the computer is responding in a very random way without, you know, without establishing any social relationship to the sound with what Jerry is doing. She's pushing back on that idea. So can we hear these things? Can we hear dialogue of this kind? I'm going to say that we do. We hear it every moment. Think about this. You are, we're all trained to hear this. You, know, you come home from a hard day at school or work, and you know, your roommate or your loved ones or whatever, and uh, you're, in the 20, you're in the late 21st century and there's this sort of smart house, and the smart house is um, you know, trained as listening to everything you're trying to do and making, making inferences. And so, and so the person, your friend, says, So, how was your day? And you say, uh, uh, okay. And the computer says, oh, you're okay. Well, clearly, you're not okay. But we heard that through the sound, not through the lexical meaning of the phrase. So excluding, extending Frith and Frisco further, we can infer gender from movement, as we heard just now. Can we infer race from movement? From sound, as another wonderful uh, student of mine, and, uh, Nina Artan tells us. Or do we hear the traces of the process of construction of race and gender? To respond to these questions, can we get by the pit with a single access form of gender analysis offer in a number of these talks? Do we need to think to a, do we need to move to a more intersectional approach? Chopek's play is often portrayed as a critique of scientific irresponsibility, but it seems that a major danger Chopek's characters saw in the emergence of robots is that, you know, like a blade runner, uh, they're successful able, able to they're successfully able to pass. As people. Helena jumping up. <laughs> because, as a new media artist, Antoinette Lafarge notes, to talk about imposture is to talk about personhood and social identity. According to Lafarge, people spend enormous amounts of their lives creating forms of order precisely to reduce or present improvisation laws, regulations, customs, traditions, ethics, all normally designed to inhibit improvisatory response. As with the prohibitions on racial intermarriage, which was enshrined in U.S. law and custom before the 1960s, the, the goal would be to prevent the improvisation of imposture, a natural threat to the social order. And of course, the part of essay invokes both race and gender passing. <coughs> now, this late turn, late in our discussion, as we reach the end of this talk, allows us a brief excursion in the direction of Masahiro Mori's notion, the uncanny valley, that asserts that as behavior of robots becomes more and more human-like, and he meant visually, and I think sonically, <coughs> a point arises and which they become less familiar to us and more uncanny, even to the point, the point of invoking aversion. It has occurred to me that this phenomenon extends beyond our encounter with robots toward any sub-living chain with entities previously regarded as objects and subalterns who suddenly begin to speak. Um, in the context of electoral politics, Barack Obama's ascension to the US presidency may be viewed as an example. Some partisans continue, despite all evidence, to regard his occupancy of the office as simple and posture, again, invoking extreme aversion. Though that's one of the fake versus statistics know about that. Um, both Rothman's Universal Robots and Blind Tom evoke the uncanny in their beholders, but the source of the uncanniness is in the beholders themselves and in their views on sentience. 